In our uh, uh, budget and uh, ministry here at Hope Church, we support a full-time missionary and his family. His name's Blake, um, and he's in South Asia, and uh, he does pastor training, church planting. They're planting a church in the big city now. Uh, They do all sorts of other work. They have an orphanage slash hostel, and uh, God's blessing that work, and we're thankful for it. Uh, We believe in the Great Commission, and that it demands us to preach the gospel in our context and beyond to wherever we can send gospel workers, and that nation is an unreached people group meaning less than 2% of people there know the gospel and believe it. And so it is our honor and our joy to be able to sacrificially give to support them. We also go and do mission trips. And uh, if you've been here since February, this, this would be a new thing to you. But when we were over there in February doing gospel preaching, uh, myself and the team of uh, dedicated souls uh, were arrested by radicals and we were thrown in prison. And um, we, by God's grace, we were sent back uh, uh, A lot of people did a lot of hard legal work to get us out, but we got back pretty scotch-free and we came back, all limbs intact, very thankful, hallelujah. But our brothers who were translators and preachers and evangelists over there, who were nationals to that country, were not released for about another month. They suffered in the danky cell and they are also going back frequently being retried because they uh, broke the law. They evangelized in a a thoroughly... uh, 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 pagan uh, uh, nation. And so uh, our prayer is that they finalize that whole court case and they have perfect and final freedom and they're allowed to keep on doing the great commission to which they are committed. Um, Because this coming Tuesday... Is a, it's a watershed day in the court trial. And, um, uh, and so I told those brothers we would pray for them today at Hope Reform Baptist Church. Please be praying for them at home. Please pray for them on Tuesday. Uh, basically, the scenario is this. The government has not been sending their false and falsified and questionable witnesses to the court in order to um, give witness and testify against our brothers. So um, basically, the court case has dragged on. If they don't turn up again this Tuesday, basically, it's going to be fine. They'll move through some formalities and they'll be okay. If they turn up and they give a convincing witness against our brothers, there will be likely up to five years in prison for these brothers. And they are pastors, they are fathers, they are husbands. So we're praying that God would spare them from that. And uh, I ask you to be praying at home, but I'm going to pray now. Can you stand up with me as we pray as a body for those who are doing God's word, God's work, God's will over there. Father God, we pray to you, we trust you. We know that your will is the only perfect divine, sovereign will. And that to your will, every other will must bow and bend and break. And we want our brothers to stay free. We want them to stay at liberty to preach the gospel on the outside and father their children and be at home with their wives. We pray therefore, Lord God, that you would do this. You would keep them free, that you would have this victory over the enemy's uh, 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 attempts in this situation. But Lord God, our desires and even their desires, we do bend our knee to your will. And we know that your will is perfect. And if you choose for them to be so imprisoned and persecuted and uh, tried and uh, attacked, then they join the ranks of those all throughout history, all throughout the Bible, all throughout the church whose blood is shed for the sake of the gospel. And we know that you will make it bear fruit. We know that Jesus will be victorious, will be glorious, will be triumphant in the gospel in that nation, regardless of the outcome of this situation. But we ask, Lord God, for your mercy. We ask for the faith of those involved. We ask that you would spare them and their wives and their children of this trial. And we ask that they are upheld by your spirit and kept by him to be bold, um, unwavering and set like flint towards being faithful. We thank you for the situation, God. And we ask for your glory to come out of it. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. amen. Please take a seat. We are in 1 Timothy 5. Our consideration today is on the value, the importance uh, of eldership. In other words, our our main theme this morning is honour the eldership. That's really the theme that we bring out of 1 Timothy 5, where Paul is writing to Timothy, who himself is in Ephesus, correcting the church, reordering, reorganising, restoring, reforming the church, because they have, through bad leadership, gotten into an abysmal state. Uh, This is always the case. Leadership goes well. The church will go well. Leadership goes bad. There is almost nothing other than replacing the leadership with good leadership. 
Where leadership goes down, the church will always follow. This is just what God has, has, has embedded in nature. It's a law of nature. As the head goes, so goes everything else. As goes the leader, so goes the people. As goes the king, so goes the nation. As goes uh, the, the preacher and the pastors and the eldership of a church, so go the church. What had happened in, El- in Ephesus is that bad guys had got into leadership. Distracted guys, selfish guys, uh, uh, heretical guys, false teachers, unconverted men were in the pulpits and were in the eldership room and making the, de- the, the decisions for the church. And therefore, El- uh, Ephesus, as a mega church, had lost its way. It was no longer zealously preaching the gospel and seeing hundreds baptized like it was in, in Paul's day. And it had a lot of correction to take place. And Timothy is then sent, and after Timothy, the letter from Paul in order to correct these things. Good leadership, we saw it in 1 Timothy 3 because eldership matters. We saw it in 1 Timothy 1 about getting rid of the bad guys. We saw it in 1 Timothy 2, it shouldn't be the women, it's got to be men. Leadership is so important in God's design and in the church and it has always been this way. God has always worked with a particular few that he raises up as leaders that then through them, he blesses the rest of the broader church or community of God. This is ancient practice of God. It's how he always works. And it's not to say that people who are non-pastors have less access to God. Right? That's a cult. Guy says, if you want to pray to, you really want your prayers to be heard, you come talk to me. I anoint you with oil. I have special access that you don't get. You're a pleb. You're, you're sort of further back in the line. I get to talk to Jesus for you. It's not that. It's not Roman Catholicism, which says the church holds the, 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 the Bible and, the, and the, uh, a secret uh, uh, authoritative interpretation of the Bible. You don't get it in your language. You just believe us. It's not that. This is to remind us that all people, every Christian, by faith and by the Holy Spirit, have access, direct access to God in prayer, have direct access to understand the Scriptures and what it teaches. However, as a people of God, we remember 1 Timothy 3, which says... We are a household. And in a household, not everybody has the same role and not everybody has the same authority. Kids, amen? Amen. Your parents given authority because authority, hierarchy, structure, and order is God's invention. And it's the same in the church. It was the the case back in Abraham's day. He was selected. He led his people. The same with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, the patriarchs. It was the true of in Moses' day and with Aaron. It was true of as they, the Israelites came into the land, God raised up judges and prophets and priests and later kings. In the New Testament time, it was Jesus and the apostles and after them, pastors, elders and overseers. It has always been God's way to concentrate his leadership and his guidance on a few that then lead the rest. And it's the same in the church. This importance of the role leading God's household means that there is a certain treatment that eldership demands. Elders and men in the role of eldership demand and deserve certain treatment. Now, I'm not saying that they deserve special treatment. Special treatment would go against what Paul says in 1 Timothy 3 when he says they've got to be above reproach, godly men. To give them special treatment would say, oh, I know he sins. Like he's got that addiction. He's got that problem in his life. He's he's harsh with his wife. But come on, he's an elder. We turn the blind eye. No, that's special treatment. That's ungodly. Paul will address that today. That's partiality. Unequal scales. What Paul commands, though, is a particular type of treatment to pastors and elders that not everybody has or deserves. He's going to call... Uh, He's going to call it honour in today's passage. So this is our big idea. Honour the eldership. Honour the eldership. Not not just the elders, not just the people, not just the men. I'm not saying here today's sermon is not honour Tom. It is not about an individual. It is not about the person. It's about the office that that person has been called by God and ordained by God and recognised by the church as being in. That is the office of eldership. He's, we're going to see that honour applied to three different uh, sort of categories today. Payment of his, of his provisions, uh, protection from accusation, and a caution in ordination because the office of elder demands honour. So look now, 1 Timothy 5, verse 17. Paul says this, 
Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honour, especially those who labour in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain and the labourer deserves his wages. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. The sins of some people are conspicuous, going before them to judgment. The sins of others appear later. So also, good works are conspicuous, but even those that are not cannot remain hidden. May God bless his own word in our midst this morning. (coughs) If I can have a deacon give me my uh, cloth back, (coughs) that would be a great help. Or a deacon's wife, Sophie, you go right there. You You can throw it. Anthony, she's out doing you. She's getting your reward. Bless you, sister. Round of applause for uh, Sophie. <laughs> she loves that sort of attention. I just thought we should solidify that uh, and her double honour. All right, so we're in, we're in verse 17. And the first uh, uh, area that Paul commands honour for the elders is in the area of payment. He says here in verse 17, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honour. Honour in this language is another word for financial aid and support. Basically, in the English, we have the word honorarium, which is the same thing. It comes from this Greek root word, which is to say that somebody does you goods or services, or if you're a consultant and you're invited to a company, or if you're a speaker or a professor and you're invited to give a lecture on a certain thing, they will pay you, they'll reimburse you for the goods, the services, the wisdom, the effort that you put in. That's an honorarium. And Paul is saying here, honour elders in this way. He uses a couple of examples here that we're going to look at from Scripture, which tell us definitely it is talking about finances. And uh, honour back in verse 3 when he was talking about widows was not merely think of them nicely, send them a card as they starve to death. He says, honour them. That means actually provide for their needs. Love them with your hands and your wallet and your heart. He says, honour elders. Uh, why does he use the word honour? Why doesn't he just say, pay their bills, right? Grab his receipts and reimburse him or give them uh, some kind of salary. He uses the word honour because it demands a heart position. That he's not just saying, you should honour them and you should pay them. He's not just saying, you should pay them, doesn't matter if you honour them. He's saying that the payment of your pastors should flow out of a rightly ordered heart and soul and mind as you consider the importance of ministry in the local church. That is, you don't have to pump and pump and pump a person who is rightly aligned with Scripture. You don't have to get the pump going full bore in order to get the water flowing out of their hearts in generosity. Once you align the pipes correctly, you align their, align their mind rightly with the Word of God, their heart is in line, their wallet is brought under the submission of Jesus, as soon as that is the case, generosity will flow. And one of the areas that a right, good, mature, straight-thinking, right-believing Christian will be generous in and believe strongly about is the fact that their local preacher should be paid. If you think that's an awkward topic to hear preach at church, Try being the preacher talking about this. So this is not help Tom's budget at the moment. This is not, we're just preaching the Bible. This is the passage we got to, all right? Not a uh, in-house discussion so much. <clears throat> but Paul says, honour them. He used the word honour, as we said, to ensure a right heart position that then brings forth giving. There's no such thing as saying, I honour the eldership. I just don't give. But I really, what I don't give, I make up for in flattery and honour and respect. That doesn't exist. A rightly honouring person may not flatter, may not send letters of commendation and compliment every Sunday. Not needed. But they pay, they give, they contribute because their heart is already in an honouring position. That is what Paul wants the Christian, the, and not just the whole church, because sometimes Christians can get in an excuse mindset and go, well, I don't give, but I'm in a church that gives. 
I know other people are generous. Every members meeting, apparently, we're making budget. So I don't give, but I believe in giving. And the Lord told me that everyone else should give, and that'll be. Anybody, any amen? Anybody got the, the spiritual gift of lack of generosity? Anybody? Um, people can think that way if we just think corporately, right? So let's make it specific. The way that Paul wants each individual household, each individual person with an income, each individual woman and man to think is, I have been given a certain uh, uh, provision of money by God. I'm very skilled. I make more. I'm not particularly skilled. We're in an economical downturn. I have lots of other responsibilities. Things are going wrong. There's a recession. I have less to give. But whatever I have is a gift from God. And there is a non-compromisable element of the Christian life, which is that I believe in the Great Commission, and even if I'm not a preacher or a missionary, my responsibility, at least part of my responsibility in the Great Commission, is to use whatever God's given me to in some portion contribute towards the paying, the supplying of preachers to the world and the church. Paul wants each individual Christian, therefore, to accurately recognize the value of what is happening in a local church. He doesn't just want to say, here's an amount to give. He says, you need to honor it genuinely. There needs to be a recognition in the heart of every Christian. I am in this thing called the church, which chapter 3 said is God's household. I'm going to contribute to the chores around here. I'm going to contribute to the needs around here. I'm going to contribute to the budget around here because this is God's household. This is so significant. He wants each individual Christian to recognize the value of things like sin in your husband being confronted. Is not there many women who would put their hand up and say, whatever salary I got, I'll give it five times over just for that one scenario a few years back when the elders came through, they corrected my husband and saved me and my children from years of suffering. Men, on the other, on the other hand, and newly married people or soon to be married people, there, do you not value and recognize the value of having wiser people, people who know the Bible more, allocated people, to be able to meet with you, prepare you for marriage, get you married? We do that as pastors. Preserve your marriage, counsel your marriage, have input to your marriage, preach towards you about your marriage. Is that not valuable to have, which the rest of the world is in darkness and the best they've got is Dr. Phil and some dumb self-help book? I hope so. Do you value that the gospel is going forward in this world and recognize that for that to happen, some people have to be allocated and paid to be able to do that? Do you value having weekly encouragement that comes from the gospel? Do you value Jesus' mission in the world as infinitely more important than your own career goals and financial goals? Do you recognize that? And if you do, then praise God. You know what's going to happen? You're going to go, of course needs in the church are not too worldly for us spiritual people to worry about. My money is just an element of my service to the kingdom. God gave it to me. I'm going to give some towards this. And an element of that needs to go towards the pastor's payment. And where a recognition of the value does not motivate... Right? You go, I know we're on this, we're in, we're in the end times, right? We're in the age where the Spirit of God dwells with us. We're in this amazing time where the Messiah is no longer mystery and shadow. He came, he died, he taught, he rose. He's been explained in the scriptures by the apostles. We have a clarity about the gospel that the Old Testament prophets and Moses with the tabernacle and those in the temple, they had no clue about the glory and the riches that we now inhabit and receive in the church age. Amen, somebody. They have all that. But I don't know. Is, is, it, all that, is, it, is it worth my money? Does it really cost me something? Paul wants to rebuke that mindset. If you recognize where you are in God's timeline, the blessings and the privileges that it is to be a part of the church, he says, here's what's going to happen. As soon as those pipes all line up, you're going to say, I want to support the gospel preaching. I want the word to go forward. I will give towards the honorary, the honorarium, the giving, the paying of a pastor. Yeah. Um, I, I'm so thankful to God for the, for the way that this is already in the lifeblood of Hope Church and I don't have to come in here with a heavy hammer on people or on you. That would be super awkward. Great if you're visiting. What a Sunday to visit if I had to do that. Not what we're doing. We're just, we're just reminding ourselves what God's word says. But basically the principle becomes this. Where a church refuses to pay a pastor, they lose the right to say they honor the word of God. To honor the word of God is to 
set aside and give honorarium to one who will preach the word of God for the congregation. So a church, maybe you individually, where there is a refusal of remuneration, it is very simple. Money follows the heart. If a church says we don't have money to pay a pastor, then that church is admitting we don't value preaching enough to pay this guy. If they're okay with the rent, that the, we need to meet rent, we can't pay the pastor, they are saying, we're not like the Covenanters. We're not like the Puritans. We're not like the early church. If we had to meet in a field but still pay our pastor, no. We would re- prefer to have a, a rented building. He can download his sermons offline. Some people do that. So Paul Paul is saying here, true honor of God's word and it being preached in a church should will always uh, manifest as paying for that pastor's wage. Now he says here, not just honor, but double honor. Now that doesn't that's not a mathematical figure. That's not saying uh, find out his living expenses, double it. He should have a Bentley. He should have Gucci bags and whatever else. Right? Not what's being called for. Very thankful for that. The doubling here is a matter of priority. Do not shift from the importance of honoring, by pay, the elders in this way. Some other things will have to give. Some other things will have to be negotiable. This is an all-important, in fact, this is the most important job in the church. Some churches will keep on giving money to the widows. We'll keep on doing soup kitchens for the poor. We'll keep on showing Christ's love for the world in doing uh, housing for those who require emergency housing and generous uh, bequeathments to those who are in need. And they'll do all of those, but they will neglect the preaching of the word. And within a very short generation, you can find these churches all around. They are doing all sorts of community works and they preach false gospels or they don't preach at all or they're all for pro-gay pastors and the church is now closing in on itself spiritually because doing some good works, they neglected the best, the most pure, the most important work which ensures that the rest of the work stays on mission. This is why preaching is the most important job and task and ministry in the church because it doesn't center a single man. It centers Jesus Christ's authority and sovereignty. Preaching doesn't elevate one person's goals and desires and skills. Preaching of God's word done rightly prioritizes and puts front and center the mission of Jesus for the church, not what we want to do and prefer to do. So the preaching of the word of God is all important in any biblical church. So some people will think, you know, I've heard, it, I've, I've heard it said, you know, if he's real spiritual, he loves Jesus, he can work for free, right? He doesn't need money. Isn't this really? And some people want to move in this way. Maybe they feel guilty about taking people's money. They're gonna, I'm, I'm more spiritual than that. I'll, I'll work without pay and I'll serve the church that way. And you are permitted to do that as long as you're not breaking 1 Timothy 5, 7 and 8, which tell us that if a man doesn't provide for his own household, he's worse than an unbeliever. So some churches get real spiritual. The pastor goes, I don't need pay. I'll work full time. I'll just get a Bannerman doll from the government or, or I'll just take a, a you know, queen's home and I'll feed my children dust and crumbs and my wife will be okay. And he's actually therefore disqualified from being an elder because he's not loving his wife well. So the church needs to help not disqualify their pastor by paying him a wage. It's not overly spiritual. Spirituality, if it doesn't affect our wallets, it's not real, true, godly, Christ-like, gritty, earthy, genuine spirituality. I've been told by one guy once, I had a mate who is a pastor, and he called me up and goes, do you know anybody opening for jobs? I'm, I'm going to apply for a second job. Church can't pay me enough. I said, that, that is not on. That is not how this works. Have you brought it to the members? "Eh, Not yet. You "You need to take it to the members. You need to tell them they are failing their responsibility. And until you've told them that, you're failing your responsibility. Don't don't earn them judgment on judgment day by not telling them their obligation now. I met with one of the guys in the congregation and I said, here's how it works. Your pastor is about to get a second job so that he can preach the word to you. He goes, oh, that's unfortunate. All right, I'm going to have to connect the dots for you. You need to call him and say, don't get a second job. I will get a second job. You will get all of the money from my second job so that you can preach the word. He said, a man can't work two jobs. I said, that's what you're wanting your pastor to do. 
This is where double honor comes in. This is where a, a young man should say, you know, he didn't have kids, he didn't have a mortgage. Pastor has kids, has a mortgage, it falls on anybody else. I'm telling you, anybody else in the congregation should work two jobs before the church fails and lets their pastor work two jobs out of necessity. Now, some guys choose to do that. I don't believe that's necessarily wise. There's different situations in Paul's life where he did work a job on the side, but he said that that's not an example to the pastors to work two jobs. He said that's an example to the congregation that no matter how hard you work, even if you're, say, a church planting apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, like Paul, you can still work enough to support the church. His example was to the congregation. It was not an example to the pastors. It was an example to the pastors to say, work hard, don't stop. Jesus loves you. He's with you. Keep going. But financially, generously wise, generosity wise, it was actually an example to the flock. Nonetheless, of course, that's an extreme example. What, one guy working a second job to pay for the pastor? That's not how it should happen either. The whole congregation should give enough to be able to provide for the pastor. Paul used this language in 1 Corinthians 9. He used the example of a soldier, of somebody tending the vineyard, somebody tending the flock. And he says, inbuilt into those jobs is a self-paying nature, a self-paying relationship. Like you work for For the army, you're not over in Afghanistan looking for jobs in the market and trying to sell off old used gun shells to pay for your meals, right? The, The army pays you. They pay you a wage because if you're not paid in that job, then you will have a divided interest and you'll be less effective in that job. It's the same as a vineyard. Yeah, okay. You don't have to let the guy who's doing the vineyard eat your grapes, but he's got to take a lunch break there for at some point and miss out on work. Okay, the guy who's watching the sheep, if he's not allowed to drink any of the milk, then he's got to take a long break in the middle of the day to go and get food. Same with pastors. If you don't pay your pastors, then he's going to go and work somewhere else, and that's time he could spend pastoring. He could spend meeting with unsaved people. He could spend preaching the word or preparing and studying for the preaching of the word. Paul Paul demands Christians to recognize the all-important task of the church. So it comes down to the congregation to see the important place they stand in in redemptive history, to see the all-important job of somebody dedicated and allocated towards preaching the Bible to the church and to the lost. It's the responsibility of the church to take on their shoulders the responsibility to say, we will take care of him, his wife and his kids, his living, so that he can be devoted to the preaching of the gospel. In 1 Timothy 5, 1 Timothy 5, he says in verse 18, I've got a Bible verse for you, right? You go, Paul, where does it say that you're really supposed to pay your pastor anyway? I've got two verses. One's Old Testament, one's New Testament. One, he quotes the old law. Secondly, he quotes Jesus in Luke. He says two. He goes, do not muzzle the ox when it's treading out the grain. What a wonderful compliment to all pastors. And then he says, the laborer deserves his wages. That's quoting Jesus. Paul pulls on two quotations and he says, uh, uh, God commanded If you have an ox that is doing work for you that could not be done without the ox, you owe it to the ox to allow him to eat of what he's producing. Let him him eat the grain. Don't put a muzzle on him. How how stingy is that? I don't have grain unless the the ox grinds it down for me, but I'm not going to let him have any of it. Well, without him, you have nothing. So actually, uh, you should let him eat. The other example is a laborer. In our modern day, this would be, you know, Day laborer, like an apprentice of the lowest sort, the lowest paid people on the payroll, Paul commands the pastor to that guy and to the beast of burden that smells and is hairy. Amen? You see some similarities there? And, and what, he's, what he's saying is not, he's not trying to glorify the pastoral office, obviously. What he's doing is saying it's an argument from the lesser to the greater. He's saying, if you would be considered by God's law as guilty of theft for not paying an apprentice, and of guilty of abuse for not letting your animal eat, how much more so should you be generous, willing, keen, zealous to pay him who feeds to you the bread of life, who guides you towards eternal life? That's Paul's argument. Therefore, the church needs to honour the church, uh, uh, their pastor. They need to honour elders by paying them. Uh, We could ask, who, who is actually supposed to be on the budget for the church getting paid? Who gets the salary? Um, There's a couple of concentric circles. Paul says, um, if we can imagine all elders in a group, he says, those who rule well should be considered double honor or honorarium paid. 
We go, okay, well, does that mean that the elders who don't rule well don't get paid? No, those who don't rule well are kicked off the eldership team. He's not saying that anybody who is just not, anybody who is an elder, who is valid as an elder, they should get paid. He's really talking about a particularity, a level, a degree of work. Think if they're working in such a way that they would benefit from having some time aside from their usual employment. If they're working so hard that they would be able to benefit the church despite having the church pay for them, if, they would, uh, if they're ruling and leading and guiding and serving the church in that way, they should be honored at least with an offer of, can we pay for you? They don't necessarily need to take it. But then he zeroes in even further and says, especially those who labor in the preaching and teaching of God's word which tells us that even from the earliest days of the church, there was a recognition of particular roles among the eldership, that some people really do give their life uh, and all of their time towards the preaching of God's word. This is a distinction we make in Reformed churches about teaching elder, the guy who preaches full-time and studies, and ruling elders, the guys who help manage, disciple, discipline, care for the church. There's a lot of overlap, but there is a particular dedication. Paul is saying the one that you should definitely pay the full-time preacher so that he can be a full-time student of the word. Beyond him, any of the other elders that are working particularly hard and beyond them, whoever else really that the church requires on their staff. And that will change throughout each generation. So Paul says, honor the elders by paying their wage. Look at the next verse in verse 19. Here we see Paul talking about honoring the eldership when it comes to accusations. Do not admit a charge, Timothy, against an elder, except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. But if somebody persists in sin, rebuke them in the presence of everybody so that the rest may stand in fear. And then that scary, wonderful verse in verse 21, I charge you in the presence of God, Christ, the angels, they're watching, I'm watching, this is God's word. Don't you dare mitigate this justice. Don't you dare allow injustice into God's household because you've got a prejudice, because he's your mate, because you hate the guy, because he sinned against you once or because you're jealous of him. Allow biblical justice to rule in your eldership and do none of this out of prejudging or partiality. That is to say, can you, can you reimagine the situation? Timothy's come into this mega church, this divided church with false pastors and false teachers and women pastors and uh, uh, divisions and false, false, believing, uh, false believers. And his job is to come in, fire a bunch of elders, establish a new preaching roster, take control of the pulpit again, fire certain people, allocate money back where it needs to be going. Right? He was even being told in 1 Timothy 5, take away some of the money from some of the widows because they're being paid in, uh, inappropriately. Oh, now he's a bad guy. He's taking money off widows. Next thing Paul is going to tell him is to kick a kitten in, sun, in church every Sunday. That's about how bad of a guy Timothy's going to feel like doing all of Paul's commands. But good leaders follow God's word. They don't care about opinions. And so Timothy's here. He's doing all this stuff. And he is now establishing elders and firing some guys. He's going to be in the prime point of temptation for somebody to come up and give an illegitimate accusation against an elder he doesn't like anyway and is looking for an excuse to get rid of. Paul's saying, don't prejudge. Don't fire a guy. Don't, don't dismiss a guy. Don't shame a guy because you don't like him and somebody shared gossip with you, Timothy. You're above that. You're a pastor. On the other end, he's saying, where there is legitimate accusation, that is, where people come forward and there's two or three witnesses. That's a biblical line of independent testimony. Two or three different people can give eyewitness testimony to this sin having been done. Then you instigate a Matthew 18 church investigation where the other elders sit him down, talk to him, figure out what the other witnesses are saying, de- decipher the truth, which is somewhere in the middle usually. Where it is found he is in sin, he has been long-term in sin, and that he refuses to repent of sin, next Sunday, you've got your sermon topic. You bring him up, you stand him in the center, you rebuke him in the sight of all, you fire him in the sight of all, he sits down, and people say, that's not fair, that's scary, that would make people feel unsafe and threatened. And Paul says, good, so that they may all stand in fear. Sometimes biblical eldership is making people shake in their boots because they've chosen to play around with the church of God, which is the household of the Father. 
Make them shake then. They're scared because they're harboring sin. Let them be scared. The kindness of God leads people to repentance. That's what this is all about. And you do not dare allow this hidden constant sin to go on, Timothy, just because he's your buddy. Just because he's your pal that you went to seminary with and you, you, you did mission over in Greece with him. I remember that back in Acts chapter 14. How amazing was that? Do not allow prejudice, partiality, mateship, friendship or any other thing to get in the way of biblical justice. Eldership is worthy of too much honour. Too much is at stake. Too much is on the line. The ministry of God's word to his people the reputation of Jesus in the world, the health of God's flock, the order of his household is all on the line when it comes down to leadership. Timothy is commanded to take it seriously. I wonder if you as a congregant might even see here already some point of application from this point. That if you are supposed to honor, even double honor, an elder, this means that you do not, you do not, you do not listen to criticisms, complaints, uh, accusations, slanders about elders. This means you might think, does that mean that if I hear something about a brother or sister, I'm supposed to not listen because you don't listen to gossip, but if it's about an elder, I even more don't listen? Like I give them an extra level of respect and honour, and the answer is absolutely. God said through Paul to Timothy in chapter 3, put men in place who are above reproach. I think that was in part in preparation for this kind of command. If you put just any guy in place, listen to any accusation, because you don't know, maybe, that, maybe it's true. God has so ordained and commanded us to put men in place to whom accusations slide off, because by and large, they're not true. I mean, he's imperfect, but he's not, he's not constantly sinning. He doesn't have a, have a lifestyle of sin or hidden sin. So that when it comes to the congregant, and you hear something, somebody complains, somebody has a criticism, a snarky word, a, a, hey, did you hear that? I heard that his wife, I saw their kids doing. You can side with God's word that says, we've put him in place because he's above reproach. I'm not supposed to listen to gossip. Stop telling me, I don't care. If it's false, you're doing the work of the devil who is a slanderer. If it's true, don't tell me, go and tell him. There's no situation in where you give ear to slander or criticism and it is ever not sin. This is to say that gossip is a two-sided sin. Gossip doesn't exist unless you give your open ear to receive it. Without a hearer, gossip is merely a sinful thought in somebody's head. As soon as they start to speak and it's criticism and it's snarky and it's this and it's unfounded and it's about an elder, then you have the obligation to say, I don't want to sin, I won't pass it on. But that's not the only time sin starts. I need to repent of listening to it. Stop telling me. I don't care. If it matters, tell them. This is the double honor that eldership is worthy of. But on the other hand, where those things are grounded, where they are true, where they are valid, and they are found out, investigated, and genuine, then that elder is dealt with in the severest of ways in front of everybody so that all may stand in fear. I've heard some amazing, some, one of my most comedic times as a pastor is hearing from some people in the congregation stuff about me I didn't know. Like I preach with a gun in my pocket. That was cool. Like sometimes slander is people capitalizing on an imperfection. They'll take something I said and go, did he mean this? Oh, he mean that? And I go, oh, I probably could have been clearer. My bad. Oh, now there's all these people who think I believe that. Sometimes it is completely unfounded and come up out of nowhere because Satan's really creative and so are bitter people. So apparently I've beaten people up because they told me they didn't want to be members here. I like the sound of this imaginary Tom. He's, he sounds cool. I want to have a sit down and drink with this guy. Uh, I have stolen and, and uh, 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 embezzled money from a widow's account in order to uh, buy myself clothes. Uh, you, that's not believable. <laughs> Kmart. Uh, the, I've heard some amazing, th I've heard some cool things about Vic that I know didn't happen. Uh, and, <laughs> And it is, it, is inter it is amazing the sorts of things that come up with. Now, here's the point. Sometimes it's funny because you hear it and you go, May, you know, maybe I'll carry a Glock next Sunday just to, just to prove it true. Um, 
I'm never really affected. I hear slander. I go, Spurgeon dealt with slander his entire ministry. I hear accusation. I laugh it off. Jesus dealt with that all of his life. I hear um, uh, false lies about me. I go, that was Paul's lie. I'm told to expect this. I don't care. I keep driving on. Like we said, my spirit animals, an ox, put the load on. I will walk. I don't care. The problem is not on the eldership side. The problem is on the congregant side. Because what happens, the, the, the secondary effect of a pastor or a preacher being slandered is that now you struggle to benefit from the word because you've listened to the gossip. And he keeps on preaching about loving wife, but Susie's neighbor's cousin's brother-in-law said, he beats his wife, what do I do with this? And I've seen it happen. People's ministry and, and ability to benefit people by their preaching of the word is lost. They, they, won't, they won't read their things. They won't answer their calls. They won't go to church anymore because I heard so and so. And you know what? That's an inbuilt judgment upon those who listen to gossip. And so while Timothy is being told, don't listen to the gossip, don't, de- don't, don't, don't uh, uh, be detrimental towards elders because you allow gossip, but also it comes down to the Congruent, and to you, and to each one of us. Don't listen, don't give ear, don't give life to gossip. Allow those coals to burn out and fizzle out. So, honour is deserved in terms of wage. Honour is deserved in terms of a protection of reputation. And honour is also deserved in the area of ordination. Look what Paul says in verse 22 onwards. Verse 23 is in brackets in the ESV because it kind of sounds like a throwaway line. Um, Drink a little bit of wine, Timothy. It's good for your stomach. Maybe you've got stress ulcers because ministry is crazy. Take care of yourself. Remember, don't listen to the legalists from chapter 3 and 4 who said you're not allowed to drink certain drinks or eat certain foods. Disregard that. Have some wine if you need to. Other than that, let's move on. He says in verse 22, I will skip verse 23. 22 says, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands. That's language for bringing a man into the eldership by prayer and and ordination over the church. It says, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands. Keep yourself pure. Do not partake in the sins of others. He's saying, oh, if you, if you quickly get these men, they're not checked. They haven't been tested. You don't actually know, but they looked good on paper or they promised you they'd help. And you're hasty with that. And there is known sin in their life or there's sin that you should have found out if you just asked. Then you are going to be, because your hands went upon them to ordain them, your hand will significantly, spiritually, uh, symbolically be upon their hand as they abuse and they mistreat God's flock. That's what he says. You will partake in their sin if you allow them into eldership, into leadership, hastily, when you could have known. Sometimes in the Bible we see they couldn't have known. Paul will bring people on the mission with him who later on are false converts. But at least he wasn't, he didn't do it hastily. There will always be false professors who are pastors or elders, but they, that, that can be mitigated by the refusal to ordain people hastily. Here's what he says in verse 24. The sins of some people are conspicuous, going before them to judgment. Some people's sins are a lifestyle. It's a big parade. They've got a whole float. They've got a flag they're waving, drunkenness, gambling, abusive, husband, whatever it may be. And you can just see it on them. You can basically smell it on them when they come through the door. They are obviously sinners. And they come up and stumble to the front and say, I would like to put my hand in the ballot to be a pastor. I think I'd be great. Obviously, everyone says, no, thank you. Go away. That's not going to happen. Allow the pastors maybe to shepherd you towards some righteousness. Other people, however, will come forward and appear very good. Look at what he says. Some people's sins go before them to judgment. But the sins of others appear later. They turn up. They're amazing. They're friendly. They're great. They're generous. They're supportive. They're flattering. They're they're equipped. They're ready. After a few months, maybe a couple of years, their past catches up to them. And you start hearing what they really were like, what they really were doing. Oh, their story is made up. Their former pastor just called me and told me of their real name and criminal history. Oh, Oh, thank you. Sometimes people come in and they appear fine, they appear great because they've learned to parrot the words and look like what you demand. And Timothy's situation, and again, I'm saying this because of the situation that we're in as a church, in in that we are growing and there is momentum and God is blessing us. Paul is saying, don't be hasty, Timothy. Don't think lots of people are here. There's a time of change. There's a lot of momentum. Uh, Somebody put up your hand. I need more elders and get anybody, Timothy. 
It would be better to labor with a smaller team of godly proven men than quickly get others in who will capsize the whole boat. Some men's sins appear later, which demands some time to be proved. So they need a sense of calling from God. They need the congregation to say, we would like this man as an elder and a shepherd over us. We trust him. We delight in him. But it also needs then some time to prove their worth. Are they patient? Are they truly humble? Is their family really happy or are they being threatened to smile before they come into church every Sunday? Is it really godly or is there secret sins? And Paul says, sin is a living thing. It's like yeast. It's like weeds. It will always pop up somewhere. And a good pastor will be patient and wait to see it. And then he flips it around and says, and it's the same with righteousness, you know. Good works are conspicuous. It's not just a matter of, oh, I'm, I'm very righteous in my heart, just not in my life. False, you're not righteous in your heart. Good works, righteousness, godliness are conspicuous. They will, they will like good seed thrown onto the ground always sprout up with righteous living. That's always the case. But he does allow for the fact that sometimes righteousness is hidden, but it cannot remain hidden. As that sometimes somebody comes and he's not the most charismatic, not the most upfront, loud, yelling kind of guy. He's not the sort of person you look at and immediately think, seeing your pastor, church planner, missionary, next Spurgeon. Maybe not. But Paul is saying, Timothy, if you get to know him, if you assess him, if you just give it some time, righteousness is impossible to keep hidden. His wife's going to be thriving. His family is going to be happy and godly. His generosity is going to be evident. His godliness is going to be proven. Give it some time. And therefore, we see that because eldership deserves honor, and therefore, you do not hastily throw men into that position. Rather, you prove them, you try them, you test them over time. Eldership, we've seen in conclusion, deserves honor. Jesus commands that the leadership of his church be held in honor. Therefore, a church should sacrificially pay them. They should protect them from slanderous accusation and gossip. And they should be patient and hasty, uh, be patient and not hasty before they put men into the office. All of this is true of the eldership. All of the honor that we see eldership given in the Bible, in the New Testament, in Paul's letters, in 1 Timothy especially, all of the honor that that we try and point towards and, and invest in eldership is a derivative honor. That is, the reason that eldership is so important is because the church whom they serve is so important. And the reason that the church is so important in the purposes of God is because Jesus is so vitally, infinitely important. He is the church's head. That head gives the body her value. He is the church's household master and eldest son who is in charge. That's why the household of God matters. The the reason that eldership matters, and this might be one application that we need to talk about today from 1 Timothy 5, if we can zoom out, the broader big picture is that God has intervened in human history to save sinners from hell. God has done what we could never do, what false religion could never do, what humanism, what materialism, what attempts, what striving, what modernism and building or industry and technology or spirituality, what nothing could ever do. God, from His infinite chasm in heaven, from His expansive holiness, from His infinitude, stepped into our sinful, timely, broken, finite world as one of us in the person of Jesus Christ. He destroyed the works of the devil. He defeated sin by never sinning and showing himself stronger than it. He took our sin upon his shoulders and defeated the law, fulfilled the law, defeated Satan, crushed his head, paid for our sins and exploded out the other side in his resurrection. He defeated death, sin, hell and our condemnation on the cross and in the resurrection. God has intervened in history to bring salvation for humanity. And and what is left as the remnant after Jesus' resurrection, what is left in the world to continue his saving work, what he has resident in the world to continue preaching the word of this amazing good news is the church led by elders who preach the word to people who love the word and spread the word about Jesus who saves sinners. That's the only reason eldership is important. 
Because the church is a church on mission, dispensing to the world this good and gracious news. Someone has died in your place. That someone was God in flesh. He didn't stay dead. He's alive. He's opened heaven. And for every person who believes, there is free and entire forgiveness in the very moment that you trust in Jesus' name. So do that. If you have not yet trusted, trust him. If you've not yet called on Jesus, call on him. If you've not yet believed for your salvation, lean on him, believe upon him and be saved. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you sent a redeemer. Thank you that you sent your son. Thank you that you showed such mercy and compassion and pity to this disgusting, vile, rebellious race of humanity. Thank you that you sent our sins upon him, that you poured your wrath upon him, and that in your mercy and according to your promise, you rose him back to life so that all those who believe in him can be saved. We thank you, God, for your glorious work in the gospel. We thank you that what the gospel does is create new people, forgiven people, transformed people, born again people. We pray, Lord God, that we would be a church of those people, that you would purify us of false Christians, that you would purify us and make us a body of true Christians in your household. Lord God, if there is any false professor or false Christian or fake Christian in our midst, would you convert them? Would you save them? Would you extend your mercy to them and bring them into your family? If there is anybody here who is well known, uh, 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 consciously outside of your family, they, they do not believe they are a Christian. They have not beforehand thought of themselves as belonging to, trusting in, worshiping Jesus. Oh God, would you change their heart this morning? Break their heart because of their sin. Make them hopeless and helpless in their own good works and point them to Jesus who saves sinners. We pray, Lord God, that you would continually in our midst preserve in us an honour of this office of eldership. You would raise up people, the men in the future who would undertake that job faithfully, well, uh, zealously and laboriously so that you can be glorified in the saving of sinners and the discipleship of them into holiness. We pray all of these things in the marvellous and wonderful name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.